What's up everybody? My name is Rosalblade and welcome back to an all new series of How Would I Fix. Now I asked you guys what movie I should fix next and you guys voted overwhelmingly for the Lamp for Time franchise. So that's what you want, huh? You want me to take another two years to do every single movie, huh? <laughs> well, it's not happening. Yeah, I do have an idea for what I want to do with the Land for Time sequels, or more or less the franchise as a whole, but like I said, just hear me out. So, as you all know, the Land for Time series has been a pretty big part of this channel. I've reviewed every single movie, both the sequels and the original. I talked about the television series, and yeah, it's just kind of become this giant part of my channel that I haven't talked about in over a year now, which is... Kind of interesting when you really think about that. Like, I still remember back in the day when I was still, I still had, like, a whole franchise ahead of me. I had just finished five or six, and I was like, oh my god, I still got, like, eight movies to do. <laughs> but it's been over a year since I've even talked about this franchise, and it's kind of crazy, isn't it? Yeah. A lot of time's gone by, hasn't it? A lot's happened, and a lot's changed. But I guess I can talk about the sequels again. For you guys. Because that's fun. So yeah, I have an idea on what I want to do with this franchise, but it's going to be a little different than you guys think. Uh, just to get it clear, I'm not going to go over and fix every single movie. It's not going to happen, okay? Frankly, for two reasons. A, fixing every movie would take forever. I mean, remember it took me almost two whole years to review every Land for Time movie? Yeah, I'm not doing that. Sorry guys, I know it's what you want, but it's not going to happen. Sorry, I just don't have the time. Second off, when you really think about it, fixing every single movie is kind of a pointless endeavor. Let's think about that for a minute. Ask yourself the big question. What is a good sequel and what does it do? It evolves the characters. It expands the world. It basically does everything that every single Land for Time sequel didn't do. When you really think about it that way, Every single Land for Time sequel is technically a really bad sequel. Even the ones that are considered kind of good in their own right, like Land for Time 3, 8, and 10, which in my opinion were the best, they're still really horrible sequels. I mean, think about this. If I were to fix number 3, how would number 3 impact 4, or 5, or 6, or so on? If I, and the same thing with 9. If I was to fix number 9, how would that impact 10, 11, or 12? Do you see what I mean? Like, every single Land for Time sequel Acts more like a, a like a one-off. That's all it really is. Like, again, number seven had aliens in it. Aliens. And yet, they're never brought up again anywhere in the franchise. I mean, maybe there was an episode about it in the TV show, but, like, yeah, I haven't seen the TV show since I reviewed it and stuff, so I have no idea if there's an actual episode with aliens in it. But you see what I mean. So to talk about every single movie really wouldn't be that satisfying. If I was to talk about number two and how I would fix number two and everything it i mean i'm sure you guys would like it fine but at the same time i don't know if i would like it because how would number two impact number three or number four and so on do you see what i'm talking about and again there's also the fact that there are 13 sequels okay i'm not counting the original the original's great i'm talking about all the sequels 13 sequels all right like everybody can agree that's crazy that's like an insane amount of sequels and Again, I think it's kind of pointless to have so many movies, even if they are just one-offs. And especially given the fact that, when you really think about it, some of those later sequels are just kind of rehashes anyway. We all know the Tiny Sore one. I think that one's number 11. I don't remember exactly. Like I said, I <laughs> it's been forever. Um, the Tiny Sore one and number 2 had the same plot arc where Littlefoot was all, Oh, I hate being little! Yeah. Yeah, that'd be kind of fun. Let's let's fix that in number two, and then fix it again in number 11. Do you see what I'm saying? I know I'm going on and ranting and everything, but yeah, fixing every single sequel would just be a complete waste of time, and it would be so pointless and not fun for me at all. So, I got the great idea and asked myself a serious question. What if Don Bluth, Gary Goldman, Steven Spielberg, and George Lucas all came together and with the proper funding was actually... Wanting to create Land Before Time 2, The Fall of the Great Light. I think that would be fantastic. So, for this, how would I fix? Instead of just going through every single sequel and just fixing it, fixing it, fixing it, fixing it for two years, because we know that's how long it'll take given my luck. Instead, 
We are going to completely revamp this franchise, starting from the ground up. Just all the sequels thrown out the window, we're starting all over. And this time, we're going to carry on the original Land for Time classic and carry it on in the same way that Don Bluth and friends would have done it. So of course, there are obviously some questions that need to be answered. First question, how will the tone be? Exactly the way you guys want it. Don Bluth always believed that children can handle anything, no matter how dark it was, as long as there was a happy ending attached to it. Which, if you think about it, kind of goes against the idea of a sequel in its entirety. But, and yeah, Don, and yeah, Don Bluth has kind of admitted he really wasn't really a fan of sequels. He actually hates the Land for Time franchise and what it became. He hated the sequels. And I think he kind of hates sequels entirely. Like, he loves the idea of Happily Ever After so much. He thinks that's like the perfect ending. And a sequel automatically goes against the idea of Happily Ever After. Like, carrying on after Happily Ever After kind of ruins it. But let's say for the sake of this scenario... Don Bluth is okay with having a sequel. Don would be like, yes, I love this world, I love these characters, I want to see how far we can take this. How far are we going to take it? 14 movies? Well, let's not get carried away. No. I think the maximum length Don and Friends would want to take this franchise would be at least to three. This would be a trilogy of films. There would only be three Land for Time movies, and that does include the original 1988 classic. So we're going to have the original Land for Time movie in 1998... We're going to have the second movie called Land Before Time 2, Fall of the Great Light, and then eventually we'll have Land Before Time 3, which I have yet to name because I have no idea where I'm going to go from that point. So, But we'll get to that when I get to it. Hell, maybe you guys can throw some ideas. Like I said, if you guys have any ideas on what you want to see, let me know in the comments below and we'll see what we can do, okay? Feel free to join on the fun of this. So, for the sake of the scenario, Don Bluth, Gary Goldman, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas all decided they're all going to come back together and with the proper funding, create Land Before Time 2, Fall of the Great Light. Now, what is the Great Light, you may ask? Well, stay tuned. We'll figure that out, won't we? Another question I'm sure everyone's going to be asking is, what is going to happen to the characters? Well, we're going to do exactly what everybody has been begging for these characters to do. Grow the fuck up. <gasps> so that means they're all going to be adults, right? Well, now, hang on, hang on. Not quite yet, okay? Remember, this is the trilogy right here, okay? We're not going to have them turn into adults right off the bat, okay? We're not going to go straight from... From little kids to grown-ups in one, in one movie. That's not going to happen. Instead, I'm going to take a page out of the How to Train Your Dragon, where in the first movie, Hiccup was like 15 years old. In the second movie, he was 20. And while in the third movie, he was 21, technically, at the end of the movie, he was officially like an adult. He was married to Astrid. He had his own kids and everything. So yeah, I kind of like that idea. We're going to start the kids off as little kids in the first movie, have them be teenagers in the second movie, and then the third movie, have them grow up to be full-fledged adults with their own families and kids and everything. And it's all going to be beautiful. It's going to be our, our, all of our wildest dreams are going to come true. It's everything we ever wanted from Don Bluth and friends. So, yeah, that's what we're going to do with this story. So for the second movie, yes, everyone is going to be about teenage years, okay? Now, let's address this elephant in the room that I think needs to be explored. How do the dinosaurs age exactly in this universe? Now, keep in mind that the world of Land for Time already, it kind of ignores some real world logic. Like, for example, the dinosaurs coexisting together. Spike, a stegosaurus, never coexisted with Sarah, a triceratops. That did not happen in real life. So, for the sake of the story, we can kind of ignore some of the real rules of nature. Now, another rule of nature is how the dinosaurs age. Now, again, this is all theory, but blah, 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 like science and everything like that. It's believed that some dinosaurs could age differently and live much longer than other dinosaurs. Like, it was believed that a stegosaurus could live to be about 60 years old, but an apatosaurus, which is what Littlefoot is, technically could live to be about 100, maybe even older than that. So, while Spike is 30 years old and becoming a full-fledged adult... Littlefoot could still be a teenager. So, yeah, again, that's another rule of nature we're going to throw out the window and just ignore for the sake of the story. And let's say that for the sake of the first movie, Littlefoot and his friends were all about somewhere between 8 and 10 years old. Like, I think that feels about right. They're, they're kids. They're young children. So 8 to 10 feels about right. All with the exception of Spike, who was born in that movie, so he's age 0. So, okay, so Spike is 0. Everyone else is about 8 to 10. In the second movie... We're going to have everyone be at that age of about 16. So everyone is about 16 years old. They're teenagers, with the exception of Spike, who is now 8 years old. Now, the obvious question you all are wanting to know now is, can Spike talk? He, he can, 
but he just doesn't really do much of it. He, he's a very quiet kid. I mean, it kind of makes sense. You gotta think about that. He is growing up and stuff like that. In the sequels, Spike was always kind of a baby still. He, that, it made sense why he could never talk, with the exception of in the fourth movie, where he did talk, and that was his very first word. And funny how he never talked again after that with the exception of uh, a Land for Time episode in the show, which I've heard people tell me, like, there was actually an episode where, where, where Spike could talk or something, and it was kind of dumb and everybody hated it, because <laughs> it kind of went against it. I know it's a real fun, enduring train for Spike and everything to not be able to talk, but again, this is not the sequel franchise. This is not the one that exists in our real world. This is my storyline. And I think, and when I say my storyline, I mean Don Blues. In this storyline, I think it makes sense that Spike would still be able to talk. But he's still a very quiet kid. He wouldn't talk that much. It'd be kind of like Ferb from Phineas and Ferb, where he doesn't talk a lot. He kind of has like one or two... He's mostly a very quiet kid, only has like maybe one or two lines. And yes, Spike still don't give a fuck about nothing. <laughs> he's still as great as ever. Okay, so with all that out of the way, I think we're finally ready to carry on. But first, before we do that, there are some things I want to take a look at in the first Land for Time. Yeah, I know I love the first Land for Time movie. I think it's great, but there's a few minor tweaks that I do want to add to it. I mean, this is a how would I fix, so even the great movies still have a little tweaking that need to be done here or there. My first major change to the original Land for Time movie would be that the 11 minutes that were cut actually do make it in that original film. So for the sake of the story, the 11 minutes that Don Bluth and Gary Goldman fought for so hard in the original did make it in the final cut. Now, yes, that does mean the original Land for Time movie did get a PG rating, but that's okay with me, and I think it'd be okay with a lot of people. That means that the long fight between Littlefoot's mom and the Sharp Tooth was much longer, a bit more graphic and intense, and again, that's fine. Another thing I want to do is change the ending to Land for Time. And when I say change the ending, I mean change it back to the original ending, how it was supposed to end. In the original script of Land for Time, after his fight with Sarah, Littlefoot took off all by himself, and that's where he meets his mom in the clouds. After Littlefoot's mom leads him to the Great Valley, Littlefoot makes it, but at that last moment before going in, he realizes that his friends did in fact go the wrong way. So Littlefoot decides to go back and save them. I actually like that ending a little better because it does show the kind of growth that Littlefoot had. And it goes to show how close he is to the other characters and how he sees them as, as you know, his friends and stuff like that. So, I actually kind of like that ending better. Again, everything else kind of plays out the same. You know, Littlefoot saves his friends, Sarah's humiliated, they fight the Sharp Tooth, they drown the Sharp Tooth, and they all arrive in the Great Valley and live happily ever after. Again, not much has changed. I just kind of wanted to add that because that was, that was in Don Bluth's original vision. So, outside of that... Everything else is virtually unchanged in the original movie. It still plays out completely the same. I know that some people might be a little weirded out as to why I didn't change Sarah, because in my original review, I thought Sarah was a tad too unlikable in that movie. Well, trust me, I have an idea for what I want to do with her in this movie, so for the sake of this story, I'm going to keep Sarah the same exact way she was in the original movie. That being said, though, I'll probably change Petrie a little bit. Like I said, I actually kind of enjoyed Petrie in the sequels a bit more than I did the the one in Don Blue's vision. So yeah, Petrie will be toned down a little bit. But again, that's kind of a nitpick, so really it doesn't make that big of an impact. So really not even worth mentioning, honestly. So yeah, outside of that, the original movie is perfectly fine. But how do we start with Lent for Time 2, Fall of the Great Light? Well, I think we actually pick up to where the adults showed up. Yeah, in the beginning of the movie, we have the same gritty tone where all of the grown-ups are beginning to move towards the Great Valley. They're on the edge of the Great Valley, they all finally made it, they're all finally there. But there's one major issue. Keep in mind that in the original movie, all of the herds were kind of somewhat prejudiced towards each other. Maybe some less than others, but that prejudice was still there. Everyone still had a sort of we care about ourselves kind of mentality. Again, it was all about, uh, it was pretty much a all for one against one for all kind of thing, you know, where, you know, like, like three horns only cared about three horns and long necks only cared about long necks and you, you get from there. So after arriving in the Great Valley, all of the grown-ups are all kind of there. They're all finally taking it all in. They're all making their own places, but they're all still kind of segregated. Like the swimmers are confined to like the lake and the river and everything like that. The three horns are confined to about the rocky, the mountain area and stuff like that. The sharp thumbs or iguanodons as I think I like the name sharp thumbs. 
Um, they're confined to kind of this lushy plain area. Again, everyone has their own kind of area where they're all kind of staying there. They're all kind of segregated. But with this giant valley and stuff like that being kind of the last refuge of food, um, pretty much for all they know, the entire world, chances are they're going to have to interact with each other. Obviously, they're going to have to go to the river to drink. Obviously, they're going to have to go into the, the caves for shade when it's hot or whenever there's like a storm or something like that. They're obviously going to have to cross paths with each other, and this can lead to a little bit of infighting, obviously. Now, again, some dinosaurs may not be as prejudiced as others, but one group of dinosaurs that's definitely going to be prejudiced are the three horns, especially Topsy. And yes, Topsy will still be Topsy in the story because it's funny. So yes, Topsy is very prejudiced and very defensive against all different kinds of dinosaurs. He and his family are now staying up kind of in the Rocky Mountain area because that's kind of where they are. In that Rocky Mountain are mostly low bearing shrubs which Triceratops were known for eating and stuff like that. They eat the shrubs, they eat bushes, they stick to that area and that's really the only area they need. There's also a nice little waterfall and pond that kind of belongs to them. It's not really a big area so the other dinosaurs aren't really flocking towards it when they have this giant river over on the side. So again, most dinosaurs are kind of keen on staying away from that area but during things like storms or if they kind of want to get those shrubs and everything for some reason, they kind of need to go over there. And Sarah's father is, of course, very prejudiced. He would chew that he would yell at them, he would charge at them, he would do whatever it took to kind of keep them away from his area. But with that being said, it wasn't just Sarah's father that was prejudiced. There, of course, was infighting between the other herds and everything. There were times when there was about to be a serious fight between the other species. Sometimes the sharp thumbs would fight against the flyers. Sometimes the three horns would go up against the uh, club tails. It's kind of like Alabama in 1930. It's like, it's freaking crazy. But then something happened. The long necks arrived. Now, again, in this universe, keep in mind, Littlefoot, his mother, and his grandparents were, as far as we know, all that remains of the long necks. They're, they're pretty much all that's left. There aren't any more long necks. And in this universe, there's no lone dinosaur or anything like that. As far as we know, Littlefoot's father is really dead. There's no Shorty. There's no Pat. Nobody. As far as we know, all that's left of the long necks is Littlefoot and his grandparents. And that's it. But when Littlefoot's grandparents arrive, it's definitely known as since they are the largest dinosaurs in the world, as far as they know. These guys are so big that most shark tooths don't even mess with them. Now, when they arrive, everyone is kind of keen on kind of staying away from them at first. Again, long necks are huge, and everyone else would kind of want to keep their distance. Like, they don't want to start a fight with a long neck, because despite the fact that long necks aren't really built for fighting, yeah, they're still gigantic. I mean, what's a flyer going to do against a long neck? Probably pester it at the most? <laughs> yeah. Nobody wants to start a fight with Long Neck. But here's the good side about being friends with a Long Neck. Grandpa Long Neck is one of the most kind, caring, and compassionate people you will ever meet. Now, remember Littlefoot's mom was a super kind and compassionate woman? Even though she believed that all her should stay, you know, you know, independent of each other, she was still a kind, caring person, and she still believed in life and stuff like that. There's a reason why she saved Sarah along with Littlefoot and stuff like that. She didn't just let Sarah fall to her death. Because that would have been awful, right? No, she had to have gotten it from someone. And that person, of course, was her father. In this universe, Grandpa Longneck would actually establish a bit of a peace between all the different kinds of dinosaurs. Since they all have to live together, it only makes sense to try and establish peace, right? Grandpa Longneck would actually try his best to help everybody have a peace. He would help the other dinosaurs eat. He would help the flyers create nests and make new homes. He would actually try his best to be like a bit of a, a moderator, a peace moderator. He would bring peace to the Great Valley. And in this kind of way, everyone starts getting along. Well, almost everybody, but we'll get to that. In a way, Grandpa Longneck kind of saves the Great Valley and all these herds and helps them get along. And in doing so, becomes the leader of the Great Valley. He is now the leader of this gigantic herd of different kinds of dinosaurs. A herd that the world had never seen before, to quote the movies. <laughs> so, yeah, Grandpa Longneck is now leader of the herd, and everyone has grown to respect and kind of admire Grandpa Longneck. All except for one person, of course, and I think we all can tell who that person is. Topsy is not having it. Yeah, he really doesn't care. He and his family still kind of want to keep to themselves. Well... Kind of. Like I said, we'll get to that in a minute. But yeah, Topsy overall is hellbent on keeping him and his family as isolated from the rest of the dinosaurs as possible. <laughs> Thanks for the offer, but I don't need help from a long neck. 
yeah. This would kind of disappoint Grandpa Longneck, obviously, because all he really wants to do is have peace in the Great Valley. And, unfortunately, there really isn't much that he can do against Topsy. Despite his large size, Grandpa is still pretty old, so it's not like that he could just whoop his ass or anything, not that he'd want to, but you see what I'm talking about. Basically, Topsy is still kind of prejudiced and kind of hostile towards everyone around him. And as a result, everyone in the herd has kind of grown a bit of a distaste towards Topsy and the Three Horns. Again, keep in mind that prejudice doesn't just magically go away. In some cases, usually it's redirected from one thing to another, which is kind of sad to say. And I think this really helps emphasize the racism themes from the first movie and now shows us in a new light. In this new movie, we re-illustrate the themes of racism and hatred. And we see in this movie that hatred and racism and bigotry don't just magically go away. Throughout the movie so far, in the first couple of minutes, we've seen that everybody kind of had a bit of prejudice towards each other, but thanks to Grandpa Longneck, that racism and prejudice began to gradually not deteriorate, but rather shift. Instead of hating each other, all of that prejudice and hatred has begun redirecting towards one certain person. Yeah. Now Topsy's getting a taste of his own medicine. In the Great Valley, because of his terrible behavior, everyone in the herd has begun to reject Topsy and his family, unfortunately. Which again, we'll go more into that about Topsy's family later down the line, but overall, yeah, Topsy and his family have begun getting kind of the butt end of all the hatred and stuff like that. Basically, Topsy is getting treated the same way he treats everybody else. Like shit. Now, usually, because of Topsy's hostile nature, nobody just kind of goes up to him and says, What up, Threehorn? What up? They don't do that, no. In fact, most of the dinosaurs, despite their dislike for him, usually kind of mind their own business and leave him alone. Usually out of fear of getting hurt by him, because he is a Threehorn after all, or out of sheer distaste. Again, Topsy and his family are often left alone on that rocky outcrop, away from the rest of the valley, but when he has to go to the river and stuff to drink, or if he's just kind of taking a walk down the line, everybody just kind of leaves him alone, either because they're too afraid to confront him, or because they just straight up don't like him. And sadly, Topsy wouldn't have it any other way. But now we cut to the ending of the first movie, where Littlefoot and his friends finally arrive at the Great Valley and are finally reunited with their families. That means Littlefoot is finally reunited with his grandparents and is thrilled to see that his grandfather is leader of the herd. Petrie finds his mom, Ducky is reunited with her family, and Ducky's parents actually are thrilled to adopt Spike, despite him being a Spike tail. And Sarah, seeing her family on the rocky outcrop, finally reunites with her father. And Sarah's father, despite being a racist bigot, welcomes his daughter once again with open arms. It's a very nice, sweet, touching scene. But then, soon after the whole reunion is over, Sarah's father is suddenly horrified to see that Sarah runs off to play with her new friends. One of them being a long neck. This should be interesting. And for that, I'm going to leave things off here. Because, like I said, we've already established so many different ground rules with this video and stuff like that. And I don't want to overwhelm everybody. So yeah, we've already established the changes from the first movie. We've established the rules this universe is going to follow. We've established that this is going to be the original film's tone. You know, where Don Bluth, Gary Goldman, Steven Spielberg, and George Lucas all kind of come together. And have decided that they're going to make this a trilogy We've already laid out the ground rules, and we've established how this the new Great Valley is going to work, with Grandpa Longnet being the leader of it, Sarah's father being still a racist bigot, and everybody kind of disowning him and stuff like that and not wanting anything to do with him. So we've picked up from where the last movie left off, and now we have so much cool potential to start from here. Do you guys like where I'm going with this? Do you guys hate where I'm going with this? Do you guys have any ideas on what to do next? Let me know in the comments below and let me see what you guys have to say. So, stay tuned for part two as we venture into the Land of Time 2, Fall of the Great Light. I'll see you guys then, guys. Stay awesome. Rock on.